discussion which I've been uh, privileged to hear today in the House. But I really want to pick up on, on two points uh, that were raised, first by my, my colleague from Mississauga, Arendale, uh, which had to do with the number of fundamental questions about the future of nuclear energy in this country which underlie this bill. And I also want to echo what uh, my colleague from the Western Arctic said, which was that as we think about that future, we have to think about not only the interests of the nuclear industry, but also the, the interests of Canadians, of, of the whole population. And so, Mr. Speaker, I think that at the deepest level, this bill raises a number of very profound questions about nuclear power in Canada and its future, about the future of AECL itself, about the future of the nuclear regulator, about the future of Canada's own can-do reactor, the future of evolving nuclear technologies around the world, competitive technologies to the can-do reactor, and indeed the future of nuclear power around the world. It's evident, Mr. Speaker, that the great uh, change which has occurred in the debate about nuclear power has been driven by climate change. That this has radically altered the terms of debate, radically altered the way in which we think about these issues. And I can say as a longtime environmentalist, uh, I have been one of those who uh, over the years has had reservations about the nuclear industry. I have moved from that position, I think, to one of being agnostic. But today, as I weigh the odds and the chances and the, and the dangers, I now find myself on the side of a nuclear future for Canada. I believe that inevitably uh, nuclear power will be an important and increasingly important component of our national energy portfolio, our national energy mix in the years to come. And that even if we funded and, and built no new nuclear plants in this country, Canada was going to be, is going to be having a nuclear future for a long time anyway. If you consider even the very lights in this chamber, two out of every five lights in Ontario in this chamber are powered by nuclear power. 40% of all the power currently generated is, comes from nuclear generators. And their importance becomes all the more <clears throat> compelling because we know what the future of coal-fired energy plants is in this province. That is to say they're going to be eliminated, which puts, puts an even greater burden on nuclear power, certainly in this part of the world, for the future. And there is no existing alternative source of energy on the scope and scale of nuclear power which can replace coal-fired generating plants. Secondly, the climate change argument puts us in a world in which we have to balance off uh, risks. And that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to make choices, to, to govern, in fact, is to choose. On the one hand, a, a world in which carbon dioxide continues to increase exponentially, along with other greenhouse gases, and puts us into a perilous future when we reach uh, an increased world temperature of plus two degrees Celsius, which takes us to a place we've never been in, in many, many generations and millions of years. Versus the well-known risks of nuclear power, which have been nu nuclear accidents or terrorist threats or how we dispose of nuclear waste. And these are not trivial matters. But we have to choose. We have to decide what is the greatest peril and can we manage the risks on the other side. C Five itself and the debate about its amendments are about risk management, about somewhere between zero liability and limitless liability, and I guess the committee came down and decided on $650 million, increasing it from $75 million. That's about risk management. The problem with climate change is that this is not a manageable risk if we continue not to do anything about it. That's the challenge, that we are in a potentially runaway situation, and nuclear power must be part of the answer to that. The third 
point that I'd like to make is that around the world we do see a renaissance of nuclear power. There are currently operating in the world 439 nuclear power reactors. They have been operating for a collective number of years of 10,000 years of experience, reactor years of experience. There are now 200 new nuclear power plants being planned around the world. During the entire nuclear period, the nuclear power period, there have been only two accidents, uh, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Only one of those, Chernobyl, had, uh, had fatalities associated with it. And there is no denying that that was a major, major accident. But what we do forget as we think about risk is what happens as a result of the emissions from coal and power plants every year from mining. The, the, the number of deaths every year associated with coal mining so that we can actually power coal-fired generating plants far exceeds the number of deaths associated with the Chernobyl disaster, and yet we never balance those risks out. And that's what our job is as legislators, to, to balance choices, to balance risks, and try and do for the future the best we can. The fourth point I want to make is about nuclear waste itself. It is a problem which I think ultimately is technologically controllable. It is the exciting part, if I may say so, about nuclear waste is that it represents a potential future source of energy which we have not found a way of exploiting yet. And there will be a new generation of reactors which will be able to extract from our existing nuclear waste uh, energy almost on an indefinite and uh, time unlimited basis. It is true we do not know exactly what that road ahead looks like of using nuclear waste for new power. But we also know that if we don't get on with change, what our future looks like in a world of plus two degrees Celsius climate change, that we have a much stronger sense of. And so, again, we have to choose, we have to balance. My fifth point is that we have an AACL a world leader, uh, a company which has led the nuclear revolution, uh, not only in power, but in medical isotopes and other areas. It deals with a, an evolving technology, which I think has uh, a, a tremendous future. Someone somewhere in the world, some industrial group, is going to be developing the next generation of nuclear plants. And the question is, why should Canada, pioneers in this area, leaders for half a century, not be that somebody. Why should we leave it to France or to General Electric if we're going to be having a nuclear future in any event? Which brings me to the sixth point, which is national interest. We have had an interesting debate recently on uh, a Canadian-owned company, MDA, which has developed uh, radar sat and the Canada arm, as to what our interest is, our national interest is, in, in, in high-tech companies. And we have said, and the government has said, and I credit them with this, that for, for things like uh, space technology, this is in the natural, national interest. And I would argue that uh, AECL is in the, same, in the same vein. It is in our national interest to take this technology, be, give it the resources, the support, to take us to the next level and to take that technology to the world. See it in terms of not only contributing to the climate change debate, but to wealth creation. And finally, uh, Mr. Speaker, clearly by passing Bill C-5, we are anticipating a long life ahead for nuclear power in Canada. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this bill. This might as well be a future where Canada is a leader. As the member for York Centre put it once in his former life, as a hockey player, what they used to say at the Montreal Canadiens as they got up to play, feeling a little discouraged, well, since we have to play the game anyway, we might as well win it. And I think the same is true of nuclear power, Mr. Mr. Speaker.